very much for, for asking me to speak. Um, I want to start by, two, by telling you two short stories. One story is about a colleague that I know in the University of Sheffield, who recently, in a large staff meeting, uh, which was being told that how they were going to do the monitoring of overseas students, um, hesitantly said, well, I'm afraid for moral and political reasons, I'm not going to be involved in this. There was a silence, and then the head of the department turned to her and said, shaking with a certain amount of anger, and then what are you going to do when some of our students blow up a bus in London? Um, after a stunned silence, um, some other members of the department um, took the head of the department aside and said, it's not a collegial way to behave. And the consequence is, even though this was a department that was going to do the monitoring, the majority of the staff in that department have now declined to engage in the monitoring. That's one story. The second story um, is about an exchange that I had uh, with a UNISON uh, official just a few days ago. Um, where we had been talking about the cuts and the fees increases and the issue of privatisation of institutions and what we could do to resist it and all those kinds of things. And then it was said to me, well, of course, in the face of a threat to members' jobs, we will have to have very, very careful discussions about how practicalities relate to our principles. Of course, what that immediately raised was what on earth you could mean by principles if practicalities were going to have an impact upon them. But that's the circumstances that we are in, it seems to me, and we have to confront those circumstances. We are in a situation in which some university departments have now decided that in order to do the monitoring exercise, they are going to produce for overseas students little booklets with their photograph in, so that these booklets will be carried with the students, and then when they turn up to classes, they have to get their presence signed off. I don't know which members of staff who might be engaged in that process have ever heard of the past laws under South African apartheid. We are also in a very confused situation where it is, as a matter of fact, the case that Universities UK is, in principle, as opposed to this as are the trade unions. The difference is, of course, that they, because they feel the obligation to get the license to uh, recruit overseas students are complying with it. Whereas the University and Colleges Union at its conference two years ago reaffirmed this last year that our official policy nationally is not just opposition to it, which is also the policy of unison, but non-compliance. Our argument is, and our argument with our members is and should be, that our members should not participate in this process at all. That is what non-compliance represents. But of course, trade unions are occupying a position that I think is best described as one as of a kind of anxious ambivalence. On the one hand, they have a policy position, which in principle ought to be the one that's carried through. It's the position adopted by the delegates who represent members at, at conference. On the other hand, there is an anxiety amongst those who are full-time officials of the union about that, what, what that would mean. What it would mean, for instance, to advise members to engage in non-compliance if what that would do is provoke a management into saying you're not carrying out your duties and therefore you're going to be sub submitted to a disciplinary offence. I want to argue, I think, that there are four things that we need to start to consider in respect of carrying this, this issue forward. The first thing is to recognise that in order to carry this forward, particularly at a time like this, when there is a danger that the moral and political issues surrounding points-based immigration are getting blown aside <coughs> by the enormous consequences of the Brown Review and the cuts in higher edu education spending that we're about to see, is that we cannot proceed on this without recognizing the necessity of having a political debate about it, a political analysis of what's taking place. And let's be clear, it's been discussed here today, but then let's just summarize it. There is, of course, a tension operating between the idea of fortress Europe, immigration controls to keep people out, and the requirements of a business community, not just an academic community, to resist the consequences <coughs> of keeping everybody out for political and economic reasons. But one of the consequences of introducing a points-based immigration system on this guy is that it changes the borders from being the edge of the state to bringing the borders inside the state. 
Because what it creates inside the state is the idea of those who belong and those who do not belong. Those who are entitled to services, housing, education, etc., and those, in some sense, who are not. Those who have documentation and legitimacy to stay, and those who are undocumented. And that is, if you think about it, an attempt to alter the process by which identity is formed. I mean, if you think about the identities that people have, Identity came to us as an idea that had a kind of liberal stroke conservative origin. It's something that you inherited your identity. There was an alternative that came about to that in the early 1920s. It was the idea that identities weren't inherited, they were ascribed to you. And that is, in a sense, what's being done now. Point-based immigration is an attempt to say those who are legitimate are those who have an identity that allows them to stay here because they bring something to the country, they're not just coming here as economic migrants for their own benefit. There is a lineage to that idea of ascribed uh, identity. I don't know if the authors of it, of the points-based immigration system, know what it is, but you can trace it straight <laughs> back to the renowned German jurist and Nazi party member, Karl Schmidt for whom the very idea of what it was to be a member of a community was something that the community would decide according to what its objectives were. Now the interesting thing about this, of course, is that both of those notions of identity, and this is a, a major advantage to us, are false. That is not the only or even the chief way that identities are formed. Our identities might come as one or the other in their initial form, but identities are forged through our lives. They change as a result of what happens to us and as a result of what we choose to do with them and how we choose to act in certain circumstances. And those are the kinds of debates that I think that we need to have as the backdrop to the practical campaigns that we need to mount. The second is, I think, a detailed political assessment of the consequences. Certainly, as far as the academic world is concerned, a detailed accounting of the incompatibility between, on the one hand, a monitoring process on behalf of the Borders Agency and what it is to be a scholar, an educator, that requires the trust, not only of your scholarly colleague, but more particularly of the student, more likely to be a more vulnerable student. We have to emphasize the absolute incompatibility of those two functions and roles as part of a campaign, it seems to me. And the third thing, of course, is to emphasize as well, and this is um, a, a direct issue that, that confronts us all, the issue of the legality of what we are asked to do. For us, as academics, if we're working in an institution, to sign off on somebody's identity to confirm the legitimacy of their claim to be present when we are not trained as borders agencies officials, not trained in identifying the authentic from the inauthentic document, would be to put ourselves in a jeopardized position, a seriously jeopardized position. Because not only would we, if we did this in a discriminatory way against overseas students, be open to legal action for discriminatory behavior, we would, if we attested to the truth, and the legitimacy of somebody's claim to be present when it wasn't true, could be held to be responsible for attesting to something that was a falsehood, and that would be a criminal offence. And we need to, I think, engage in a thoroughgoing exercise of explaining to all of our members, whether it be in Unison or the UC or in Unite, the three major unions that represent staff in higher education, that all of these things need to be kept in mind. The last thing I want to say, and perhaps the most important thing is that because of the danger of this iniquitous piece of legislation just going through under the smokescreen of the concentration of effort now to resist the privatization of higher education that will take place as a result of the spending review and, and the Brown proposals, we have to make sure that this issue is fought alongside the defense of higher education. We have to make the argument clear to every overseas student that the fight against fees that is aimed at British students 
and the fight against the privatization of the sector is their fight too. And for anyone who's concerned to fight against the fee consequence of the Brown proposals or the cuts in higher education spending, any British student who is concerned to do that, any British academic who is concerned to do that, we have to explain to them the inconsistency of what they're engaged in if they're not prepared to put a comparable effort into fighting against the discriminatory aspects of the points-based system. I think if we can do those four things, we put ourselves in a position where we bring this issue back into the headlines and we can make a significant difference to it. And I have one last thing to say, and that is for everybody in this room who does work in a college or a university, there is a simple question. Has your university and college union branch debated this? Has your students union had a motion before its general meeting debating this? Prior to those meetings, has there been a public meeting of the students union and the UCU and hopefully of the other unions on the campus debating the points-based immigration system? Because you need the meeting to debate the issues and debate the politics first and then take it to the branch meeting of the unions. Because the reality is, the employers might not like it, but they will comply. They, as a matter of fact, are looking to us to disrupt the system. They can't publicly urge us to, but they would be quite happy if we did. So the question is, are we going to?